So last time we talked about how a left moving wave and a right moving wave with the same wavelength propagating on the same medium like a string give rise to what's known as a standing wave. And this is something that can have a sinusoidal profile, but it doesn't travel to the left or the right. It's kind of fixed in place where there's certain positions that don't vibrate at all, and in between, you have vibrations up and down in simple harmonic motion. And these are particularly important when we're understanding the vibrations of a stretched string that has two fixed ends. So those vibrations can be standing waves because if you have a node at either end, then that satisfies the condition that the two ends of the string will not move. So that's required if you have something like a guitar string where those two ends are, are literally fixed in place. Okay. And so if we want to understand the different ways that a guitar string can vibrate, then basically what we want to look at is what are the possible standing waves that we can have where you have nodes at the two ends of the guitar string. And so you see that you get these various possibilities where only certain wavelengths are allowed. So what I wanna do in this lecture is take you through a calculation to figure out what are these allowed wavelengths, number one, and then number two, to understand what frequencies are going to be produced or what frequencies do these various oscillations happen at and therefore what frequencies of sound are going to be produced. So here's a question to start off with. I'm choosing that the string is a string that has a length of one meter. Uh, it turns out that that would be a typical length for an upright bass. So that's the example that I'm using. And so we want to predict what frequencies can that upright bass string oscillate at in simple harmonic motion? And so the first thing we're going to do is say, what are the allowed wavelengths for these oscillations? So maybe pause the video, take a couple of minutes to figure out which wavelengths are allowed if we require that you have a node at the two ends of the string. All right, so let's have a look. Now, the first example is a little bit confusing. It throws some people off because in this kind of a situation where you have the string oscillating up and down like this as a whole, then what you realize is that there's not even an entire wavelength in the, on the string between the two ends. Remember, the entire wavelength is is like you have to look at the length over which the whole pattern repeats. So that usually includes the up part and the down part and coming back. And so in this case, the full wavelength would actually be twice as much as the string. We actually have to imagine that the string continues and then if it goes up and then down in the part that is real, then there'd be another part that goes down and then back up, and that would make up a full wavelength. And so for this particular standing wave, the wavelength is actually two meters, even though the string is only one meter long. For the second one, you see that you have one full wavelength contained on the string. If the string were continued from this point, then the pattern would just repeat. You go up, down, and you'd go up again and down again. So in this case, the wavelength is the same as the length of the string, which is one meter. In this next case, we can look at how much of the string uh, do you have to go along uh, before you repeat. So you see in this case, the full wavelength actually fits on a part of the string, which is taking up just two thirds of the length. And so we'd say the wavelength for that pattern of vibration is two thirds of our length of one meter. And then finally, in the last example, you see that one wavelength only covers half of the string. There's two full wavelengths that fit between the two ends of the string. And so in this case, the wavelength is one half of a meter. 
and we could continue and there'd be a pattern of smaller and smaller wavelengths as you got more and more nodes in your standing wave in between the two ends. So now that we've understood the wavelengths, I want to understand what frequencies are these going to oscillate at? What frequencies are these various standing waves going to oscillate at? And that will determine the frequency of sound that is produced. So we're going to assume as a given that there's a particular wave speed for waves on this string. And I chose a typical wave, wave speed for a stretched string on an upright bass and that is turns out to be 100 meters per second is actually quite fast and so what i want you to do is figure out what are the frequencies that correspond to these various wavelengths so take a moment uh, pause the video and then work it out for those four cases you may want to recall that the basic relation between wave speed wavelength and frequency is this one here that the wave speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. We derive that for traveling waves, but it also holds for standing waves because remember the wavelength and the frequency for a standing wave are the same as for the traveling waves that it's built up from. Okay, okay so let's talk through this example. And so what we're going to do is start out with this basic relation that the wave speed is equal to the wavelength, which is represented by this Greek letter lambda, times the frequency. And now what we want to do is predict the frequency for these various examples. And so the first thing we want to do is just kind of rearrange this equation to be an equation for frequency um, instead of the equation for velocity. So we just divide both sides by the wavelength lambda. So that gives us that the frequency is equal to the velocity divided by the wavelength lambda. And now we're just going to apply this for the various cases here, remembering that the velocity was given to us as 100 meters per second. Let's see if we can get rid of that extra little box here. Perhaps not, but I could move it. Okay, so let's, let's get back to our calculation. So let's do the first example. The first example, the frequency is 100 meters per second. And then we're going to divide that by the wavelength of two meters and that's going to give us 50, and the units are one over seconds or hertz. Okay, so I'll call that F1. Now looking at the second, second example, we have that the frequency is 100 meters per second, and then divided by one meter, and so that result is 100 hertz. And for the third one, we have 100 meters per second, and then we've got two thirds of a meter. Okay, so we could, we could, if we want to convert that to a decimal, which works out to about 0.667, um, and that ends up being, or just do it in terms of the fractions, the answer ends up being 150 hertz. And then finally, the fourth one gives us 100 meters per second divided by 0 0.5 meters. And if you work that out, it is 200 Hertz. Okay, so that is all summarized here on this next slide. And what we see in the end is something kind of amazing. So we figured out the various ways that the string was allowed to vibrate in a standing wave we found these various allowed wavelengths. We've converted those into the frequencies at which the string would oscillate in those different ways that it's allowed to oscillate. And you see that all of those frequencies are multiples of 50 Hertz. 
Okay, and this is exactly what we were looking for for the behavior of a musical instrument capable of producing a musical note. So remember, the musical notes were sounds that were combinations of a fundamental frequency and then multiples of that frequency. And so that is exactly what we found here for the behavior of a stretched string. So this helps us understand why so many of our musical instruments, violins, guitars, cellos, pianos, are based on the physics of a stretched string because that is something that whose natural oscillation frequencies are all multiples of a fundamental. Now, when you actually pluck a guitar string or hit a piano string with a piano hammer, you don't just get one of those ways of oscillation. Generally, that produces a complicated oscillation that you can understand as a superposition of these various simple harmonic oscillations. So the complicated way that a guitar string would vibrate would be some combination of this simple harmonic oscillation with the fundamental frequency, and then this one with double the fundamental frequency, and this one with triple the fundamental frequency. So what I wanna do now is actually demonstrate a situation where, uh, I'll get the guitar out and I'm gonna demonstrate um, these various ways that a single guitar string can oscillate. And so I've got the guitar and I'm going to just look at the, the largest string. Let's actually get a little bit of light because it's, it's just getting dark here. A little bit light, of, light over here. Um, and so that's a string that sounds like this if I pluck it. Okay, and so what I'm telling you is that that sound that you're hearing is a combination of a fundamental frequency and then all these harmonics. And so what I can do is actually make the same string uh, vibrate in a way that mostly just contains that fundamental, but I could also make it vibrate in this second way that corresponds to the second harmonic and the third harmonic and the fourth harmonic. And I could do that by just putting my finger gently on the string when I pluck it to make sure that there is a node in um, in a specific place. Okay. So to get the fundamental mostly, I can just pluck the string in the middle and and then it will and I could do that gently and then it will mostly oscillate back and forth. And so let's do that here. Okay, so that's that has the same tone that we heard for the the regularly plucked string. Just just a slightly different timbre because it has less contributions of the higher fundamentals. But now what happens if I if I just gently touch the string in the middle, so I'm not going to I'm not going to press it down and um, and press it and use the frets. So that's what you often do playing a guitar and that actually makes the string shorter. I'm going to make the string vibrate in such a way that the whole string is vibrating. So I'll take my hand away so we can see that. Um, but it'll have a node in the middle, just like in that picture of the second fundamental. So this string is going to oscillate up and down like this. Uh, it'll be fixed in the middle because I start out the oscillation that way. And so we'll see what it sounds like compared to this. So now, okay, so it's the same string but vibrating in a different way. And musically, it sounded one octave higher. But what we'll learn is that that means the frequency of that vibration is twice as much as the previous one. And now I'll, I'll press the string in a different location, just one third of the way along. And that will set up a node one third of the way along the string. And it'll be that third way that the string can vibrate. So I'm gonna do the, the fundamental and then I'll do the second harmonic and then the third harmonic. So here's fundamental, second harmonic, and third harmonic. Fourth harmonic, fifth 
fifth, sixth, Okay, so you hear that it's possible to actually set up all of those different harmonics just by putting my finger gently on, a, on the place where I want there to be a node. And so I'm just going to refer one more time back to the diagram just to show you where I was placing my finger. So to set up the second one, I place my finger right in the middle. For the third one, I placed my finger right here. For the fourth one, I placed my finger right there. And then I plucked it, and that ensured that there was a node in this, in this specific place. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, next time, we'll see that with the spectrum analyzer. So we'll actually see that you get these different combinations of harmonics, and then we're going to go on and talk about how other kinds of musical instruments also have the same type of phenomena that they pr vibrate in different ways with frequencies that are multiples of a fundamental frequency.